study the sun in all its uh, glory. It will make measurements of the sun's disk, its corona. It will make uh, measurements in situ at uh, a location, Lagrangian point L1, about 1.5 million kilometers from here towards the sun. <clears throat> so it's a big uh, mission uh, to, to, to address a number of um, <clears throat> questions related to phenomena associated with the sun. And one of the payloads, SOOT, uh, is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, the principal investigator of SOOT is Durgesh Tripathi. I am responsible for delivering the instrument itself. And the project scientist is Srijit at uh, Manipal. So uh, what is SOOT? <coughs> it's, uh, as I said, a part of the Aditya L1 mission shown here. The biggest payload on the mission is VLC, and right next to VLC is where SUIT sits on the top deck of the satellite. That's just a close-up view of SUIT. I'll uh, describe a little bit more detail uh, what SUIT uh, involves, but before that, let me highlight that building a facility like this is a massive team effort. So all I'm doing is representing the whole team which has been involved for the past more than a decade. Uh, in, uh, in conceptualizing uh, and designing and actually building this payload. <coughs> and some of them are represented here. I'm sure at any point of time, this list keeps changing and uh, this, this, is, this is one version of it. And uh, this is just a, a credit sheet uh, where suits hardware and software and different teams who are involved at different places in the country, both inside ISRO and outside ISRO, uh, in realizing this payload. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, SUIT is going to be launched and uh, set on a halo orbit, an orbit around this point called Lagrangian 1, uh, four Lagrangian points, as all of you know, between the Sun-Earth system. So this one is between Sun and Earth at a point which is about 10% towards the direction of the sun. It's a very advantageous vantage point. To look at the sun, all the payloads can continue facing the sun, collect data from the sun all the time, and all the, uh, you know, at the back of the telescope, uh, satellite can point towards Earth all the time and keep, uh, whenever it's visible to the ground stations, the data can be downloaded. And this can happen <coughs> in principle 24 by seven. So this is a very advantageous position to study the sun. Uh, that's just a, a less cluttered view of where L1 would be um, in, in terms of sun and earth. And as earth moves around the sun, that point co-rotates. That's another view of suit, uh, the Aditya satellite. Um, as I said, this is the biggest payload. It's a chronograph, VELC, being built by uh, the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. And um, suit is sitting here on the side of it on the top deck, and there are X-ray instruments, high energy X-rays, soft X-rays, magnetometers, uh, particle analyzers, all kinds of the whole works. So this is a mission which is really an observatory class mission to study sun, as I mentioned before. The payloads specifically are uh, visible emission line coronographs, suit, solar, low energy X-ray spectrometers, SOLEX, High energy L1 orbiting spectrometer, Helios, solar wind particle experiment aspects, plasma analyzer package for Aditya Papa, and a magnetometer. So you can see that it covers all the way from visible, ultraviolet visible, soft X ray, hard X ray, particles, magnetic field, and so on and so on. So I'm just re emphasizing that such an um, um, all compassing mission. Uh, is uh, rare to study the sun, and uh, maybe one of its kind. <coughs> and I'm specifically talking, going to talk about solar uh, suit instrument. The instrument looks like this in an uh, artistic view, uh, or a SOLIDWORKS model. The front end of the instrument is that side, which points towards the sun out there. The light comes in from the <coughs> sun from there, 
there is a door and then there is a, uh, a thermal filter uh, here which uh, which is a very important part of this payload and then the light goes in through this baffle system to the primary mirror here reflects off to the secondary mirror here goes in through this baffle to a shutter uh, uh, focusing lens make a, a, a filter wheel assembly mechanism some uh, field uh, <coughs> corrector lens mechanism and the detector assembly here. So that's a basic layout. Light goes in back and forth like that. It's folded up to, to fit within the space available. And it's an off-axis uh, uh, arrangement to, to make sure that the scattering, ghosting, etc., are kept under control. Sun is a very bright source. So why do we build <coughs> uh, payloads like this? Sun is a, a very, very dynamic um, object, and it uh, happens to be the closest star. Uh, and uh, we can study it in great detail. That's an advantage. If you want to study stars, sun is the best laboratory. You can't have a star which can be studied to that level of detail as sun. Uh, some of these, uh, I think the colors are lost here, so there's some detail here. That's a radiative dominated zone in the sun. There's a convection domination. Then there is a photosphere and the atmosphere and all kinds of activities happening on the sun. <coughs> so this dynamic nature of sun was first um, noticed in, and recorded by Galileo, uh, where he spotted the sun spots um, and also noted that the sun rotates and the sun spots move, so he had charts which show how the structures on the surface of the sun. So that's the first indication that sun is not uh, just a boring disk of light, but it's actually something uh, more interesting. Some of these sunspots can be very large. You can fit the whole Earth within the umbra region of the sunspot. So there are really massive uh, features on the sun. And this is uh, a, a modern look at the sunspot. You can see it's not a static system, it's a very dynamic system, not just the uh, sunspot part of it, the umbra, penumbra, etc., but uh, or, uh, the region around is also very dynamic. It's continuously boiling and settling. And so these are the granules. So at the smaller scale, there might be structure below this also, but at this reasonably small scale, there is uh, this kind of granules which are boiling up and settling down in a, in a, fa in a way on the surface. There could be <coughs> these things called flares which happen arbitrarily at different locations on the sun at different times. Nobody can be able to predict when and where they will happen. And one of the uh, prime science goals of SUIT is to study these phenomena called flares and how that could lead to various other phenomena on the sun, such as um, this uh, ejection. So you can see this massive loss of material ejecting out of the sun. And to put this to scale, you know, if you take that thing which is came out of the sun, uh, that ejection which happened out of the sun, put that to scale, Earth is sitting down there. That's the kind of scale of stuff uh, which is coming out of the sun, these kind of ejections. Then there is um, also if you have, uh, when there are eclipses, natural or artificial, you can study the corona of the sun. It's beyond the, uh, the atmosphere. Uh, and when you study the corona and the emission lines in the corona, you find that these emission lines are coming from materials which cannot produce those lines unless the corona is extremely hot, about a million Kelvin. And another reason why we are building Psi suit is to look at this precise question where the photosphere of the sun happens to be at, you know, 5,700, 6,000 Kelvin. Up there, so far away from the sun, the corona, which is much less dense, how uh, energy gets up there to heat it up to a million Kelvin and how it stays there at a million Kelvin. And the corona itself, this is an artificial, um, uh, you know, eclipse. The corona itself, it is not a stable system. 
It's very dynamic, just like the sun, the corona itself. It's dynamic, producing these coronal mass ejections uh, at, uh, at various instances. So this is also another reason uh, <coughs> to look at the sun, because if some of this material happens to travel towards Earth and hits Earth, the, the radiation, the particles, they can play havoc on um, communication systems, satellites, um, uh, power supply systems, all kinds of issues. So we, we would be able to, if we are able to predict these in, even a little bit in advance and predict whether they are going to come towards us and hit us, that will help us at least to switch off those satellites, shut down the power systems, protect them in various ways. In addition to all that radiation and particles coming out of the sun, we know that the sunspots um, have a rhythmic cycle on top of it. And if you put a grid on the sun to study this rhythmic cycle and try to see where they happen at what time scale, you get these beautiful butterfly diagrams, which the y-axis is the latitude on this uh, grid scale. You can see that um, this, this sun, uh, when it, there is no, uh, there's a period in the sun where <coughs> there may not be any activity and there could be a period where the activity could peak. And you study this, you can see where the sun spots happen as a function of latitude and how many of them happens at a given time. And you get this diagram. So you can see that uh, all from almost nothing, it grows all the way till 30 degrees latitude, a lot of activity, and then it comes down back. And this is just the same thing represented in a slightly different way. So this uh, rhythmic cycle of the sun, which is over 11 years, and that's another uh, wonder why, what drives that. And on top of it, um, all this is driven by uh, a magnetic fields entangled in the sun. Um, and almost every action on the sun has a, 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 a something to do with the magnetic fields. And this is an image which shows the magnetic field structure. The whites are one polarity, polarization, and the other one is the other polarity of the magnetic field. So you can see magnetically also the sun is uh, very active, and this uh, cycle follows, uh, the magnetic fields also follow the cycle pattern. Uh, it peaks, starts from a peak, goes to a very low active period, and then comes back up. Oh, clearly all the visible um, actions happening on the sun, the dynamic visible actions on the sun is intricately linked with the magnetic activity also. And this is just a, a, a simulation which shows uh, the complicated structure the magnetic field around the sun could uh, uh, look like uh, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty serious, but the fact remains that we are in a state when you studied sun enough to start to make these kind of simulations and try to understand how they could be um, involved in the overall uh, uh, dynamics of the sun. So let me, um, uh, I hope I have tried to convey the, the, that the sun is not a boring object in the sky, but it is such a dynamic object which has direct implications to our lives in not just sustaining life, in, our, in ways of our modern life in terms of communication, power, et cetera, et cetera. So let me uh, try to put this in a little more quantitative fashion. If you look at the solar spectrum, uh, the irradiance from the sun, this blue line, and if you see over what time scale things over that long time scale which we are talking about, you can see that the, uh, the irradiance, this blue is for the, uh, um, uh, for one state of activity of the sun, the maximum, and the red one is for the, sorry, red is for the maximum and the blue is for the minimum. And you can see that over most of the spectrum, the radiation is very, constant, it doesn't change. So solar radiation, although we looked at all those activities like the flares, ejections, um, all kinds of activities, sunspots, etc., by and large, if you take the total light coming out of the sun, it doesn't change even over that long time scale. It's very little change, much less than a percent overall change. 
But what is interesting is almost all of that, 60% of that change is happening in this wavelength band. You can see here, marked. This box is slightly shifted, but you can see this difference. So that is the band over which um, the variation in the sun's irradiance happens over this time scale. And that happens to be a band which is not really studied because it, it ha falls within the near UV, far UV regime and somewhat hard to study. And people have made attempts to study it, but either the study has been not continuous for a long time or, or not over the entire disk, only some part of the sun. So there have been various limitations, surprise, surprise. So sun being the closest star, it has not been as well studied as one would have hoped for to understand what is driving that. Here. And mind you, that is UV, and UV is directly coupled to its atmosphere. And any variation in the UV emission from the sun has a direct implication to a lot of things, and that I'll touch upon that a little later. But before that, if I look at the temperature profile, I think uh, one of the previous speakers, Anusha, I think, uh, did show this graph. Temperature profile of the solar atmosphere you see this sudden transition, as I also alluded to this, once you get to the coronal region, the temperature goes up to a million compared to sub 10,000, 5,000, 6,000 in the photosphere heights, chromosphere photosphere heights. So what happens it's suddenly here? That's something which one would like to understand, and that is clearly related to something going on there at that wavelength. So that's why uh, this, Wavelength range is very important to study, and which is what SOOT and VLC and other payloads are trying to address. So SOOT is going to cover that precise wavelength range from 200 to 400 nanometers with eight carefully selected narrowband filters which will probe dynamics at different heights in the atmosphere of the sun. You see, saw that transition region in the chromosphere. You probe different heights into that and three broadband filters, which will look at um, more of uh, the overall spectral variation and its relation to uh, sun climate relations, et cetera. It will have a large field of view, much larger than the solar uh, disk radius, so you can see action happening outside uh, the solar disk also. Of course, the coronagraph also will see it, and then it will be a combined instrument to study what happens beyond the uh, atmosphere. Pretty good angular resolution, about 0.7 arc second per pixel at that wavelength, uh, which corresponds to about 141 millimeter diameter primary mirror of the telescope and the focal length that leads to that resolution. We aim to get a signal to noise ratio of something between 50 to 100 in the darkest features of the quiet sun. So when the sun becomes active, this will change, but at least for, even for the darkest features, we would like to get to that. And we also saw that sun is a very dynamic, even, even uh, kind of at a given time slice, the surface of the sun is very dynamic. Uh, and we would like to look at the structures in great detail, so we need a pretty good contrast at close angular scales, and that's another design driver for the instrument. So as I said, there are eight, 11 filters. Um, eight of them are narrow band to pick up various um, their probes to various activities in the sun, various heights in the atmosphere, and then there are three almost continuum measurements which would look at sun um, climate relations, etc. So the aim is to catch the variety of activities on the sun on a continuous basis, 24 by 7 through the year, quantify their effects on space weather and geospace, and it's important to do this over a long period of time. A, a, a short balloon bone experiment or a rocket experiment or a short experiment is not going to give us enough data to understand that small time variations over short periods uh, versus the large variations over large periods. So coupling and dynamics of the solar atmosphere, how energy gets channelized, solar flare studies, prominent studies, sun climate studies, um, in various ways, those are the four key topics. 
uh, the flare light curves, one of the, I just show you some examples. The flare light curves at different wavelengths look like this, but if you look at it, that precise wavelength near UV is not studied at all. You don't see any instrument which has studied that in great detail over that period of time. So suit would be a key instrument to fill this gap. Similarly, this question of why the corona is a million Kelvin while the uh, photosphere is at 6,000 Kelvin, that's another question you want to address. UV emission from the sun as it varies, you can see the solar minimum and the solar maximum, the temperature of the upper atmosphere, this is height, the atmosphere, changes. So that has a direct implication on Earth's atmosphere and its composition, and that can be understood. Uh, and the idea is not to study sun as a star and say the radiance has changed, but to say what happens on the certain, uh, disk or the atmosphere which is driving that change. That's what we are trying to understand. Uh, so I will just quickly uh, run through a couple of slides, trying to give you a glimpse of what uh, makes building such an uh, uh, instrument difficult. First of all, if you want to work in the UV regime and look at something as bright as the sun, your instrument has to be built in an ultra clean environment. Any kind of particulate contamination, tiny levels of particle contamination could create scattering, which will destroy your signal because you won't get the contrast you want to achieve between close by uh, structures on the sun. Any kind of organic molecular contamination when exposed with UV light can polymerize and affect your transmission of the instrument. So that is an, another thing which has to be very, very carefully controlled. So contamination controls our lives while we are uh, building and planning and building this payload. It, it is a, it's an important aspect of how this payload is built. And uh, the other problem is, you can see here the area which we want to study, the light from the sun changes over a factor of 40. Uh, at the short, from the shortest wavelength to the longest wavelength. And we have narrow band filters at the end where there is very little radiation and broad band filters at the end which has a lot of radiation. And when flares happen on the sun, those spots can brighten up by factors of 10 or 50 even, really ex large flares. And therefore that can just set the sudden brightness up so much. So even for a very small exposure, which you can achieve with the CCD, sun can get 100 times brighter than the CCD full well capacity. So to control this radiation, sun happens to be bright and varying by a large factor. Control this uh, uh, <coughs> brightness to a level where it is within the dynamic range of the system, or build the system with a dynamic range which can accept this variation is a, is a big problem. So we had to use a particularly designed thermal filter which takes care of this. It has multiple roles. First of all, it has to reject almost all the outer band radiation coming in, which is mainly heat. So you don't want heat to enter our payload and uh, change its environment. Heat should be rejected completely, mainly visible and infrared radiation. And even within the band which you want to observe, we have to cut down light to a 0.1% or smaller. And that has to be done in a way that you get enough signal even in the darkest features of the sun and you don't saturate uh, when the sun gets brightest including the flares happening and so on. So all this can be achieved by multiple techniques, carefully designing the thermal filter, um, which does all this. Um, also, we have to do double filtering, where in-band light comes in to a small fraction of the in-band light comes in, but outer band light is rejected. And this is not outer band just within the vicinity of 200 to 400 nanometers, sun emits all the way up to the detection limit of the CCD, so that has to be carefully controlled. So even up to 1100 nanometer, the light has to be pushed down, suppressed down to a very large factor 
so that that light does not enter the payload. Um, the other problem is if you keep looking at the sun's full disk and take data at that high resolution all the time, the data volume ends up being 135 GB every 24 hours, while our downlink capability from that distance allows at a maximum of 21 GB. So there is no way to do, uh, take full disk images all the time. It also slows down observation. Taking full disk images are uh, slow. So we need onboard compression. Also, you need some onboard intelligence to switch from full disk to region of interest mode. So something interesting happening on the surface of the sun. Just zoom the instrument to that area and then collect light and keep looking at that part of the sun. So this is a normal operation mode of the uh, instrument where you take full frame images in 11 filters. Each of them takes four minutes, run it once every 30 minutes. But in between, most of the time, it, you will be looking at those region of interest where some action is happening on the sun continuously. You also take one full frame image every minute, but that's a binned image. I'll tell you why that is required in a minute. Um, this, this is because we want to study the, this is just a light curve of a solar flare and different wavelengths. And you can see that in UV, that is where the light happens. And what we are wanting to study is the early initiation phase of this flare. What happens in this region? What drives that change which leads to the flare initiation? Which means you have to get there very quickly. Even before the flare happens, you have to be there. But if you don't have the full disk image, you don't know where the flare is happening. So you need to keep history of the sun, so what is happening. But you can't take full disk images, which can be downloaded. So these images are kept on board. And some onboard intelligence mechanism will use information from the other payloads, like Solex, Helios, et cetera, and this historical data, and use them to figure out when flare initiation is happening on the uh, sun, and then localize where that is happening using the historical data, and then switch into a flare mode so that you zoom into that area and keep taking images for next two hours to follow up what is happening with this flare. So it's a complicated system, which has also involves auto exposure control. As I said, the, the, the flares can be very bright. So on board, you have to look at the flare brightness, whether it's approaching saturation, you have to ex reduce the exposure time, and vice versa. So a lot of onboard intelligence is required. And if you're not observing a part of the sun, but only a localized region, that region moves and differentially moves um, as, uh, and the, the motion could be rotated with respect to the CCD axis. And this also could lead to um, complications in terms of flare tracking, et cetera. I'll skip this slide. Uh, this is the last slide. There are similarly four science-driven modes which has been built into the system through this uh, onboard intelligence. We have also formed a science suit science management panel, the members of whom are listed here. So if you are interested in suit science, please contact the science, uh, suit science management panel members. This management panel, panel drives all the uh, activities related to suit. Each of uh, the suit science cases as a lead investigator, so you could also contact the lead investigator if you want to plug into one of those science cases, which is already identified and listed here. So there's about 17 or 18 science topics and the corresponding lead investigators listed here. So please contact them. Um, Suit so is going to produce a wealth of data on Sun and combined with other payloads on, on Aditya, it is going to open up um, doors that has not been so av not available to study the sun. So please make the best use of it. Thank you. Uh, the suit payload is currently in the final stages of integration and testing in ISRO's uh, Martha-Hurley facility. The mission itself is expected to launch in July, around July this year. It will take about three months to get to L1. And there'll be a few months of calibration and performance verification, and then five years of nominal operation period. Maybe it will last longer, hopefully. 
That's just a photo showing suit in a test chamber, some of the early images within the test chamber in different filters. I'll skip this uh, because of time. This is just a short saying, uh, slide sh showing different stages of suit dif uh, building. You can see people have to work almost in a space kind of environment because of the cleanliness requirement. That's a fully assembled suit in the lab. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I took a little more time than Thanks, Thanks, huh? yeah. We are out of the formal time for questions, but I'll still take two. Hi. Regarding these narrowband filters, I have uh, two quick questions. One is that, uh, could one have considered a spectrograph? And you also talked about the attenuation, which has to change dynamically across. How does it affect the absolute flux scale measurement, or is that not relevant? Yeah, so I didn't have time to mention that. Uh, we will be calibrating the suit um, against standard objects in the sky. The problem is standard objects are, even the brightest standard objects are too faint. If you take Vega or Sirius, they're too faint compared to Sun. So you have to deal with another order of magnitude or dynamic range there. But we will take log exposures once in a while during calibration phase and uh, flux calibrate. It's more complicated because the spectrum of the Vega is very different from the spectrum of Sun, et cetera. But anyway, there are details in there. So absolute calibration would be done periodically. Now, why we didn't go for a spectrograph? Uh, you saw 200 to 400 nanometer uh, range. A lot of that is continuum. We are not really interested in that bit of it. There are features in which um, you want to pick up certain lines and separate them with the wings and to create an index out of it, especially in the magnesium and calcium, et cetera. So better done with properly designed filters rather than a spectral. Um, so there is a conscious decision to go in a spec imaging mode. And if you go to spectral mode, getting a full disk image is problem. So people have studied sun at these wavelengths, some part of the sun for some time, Maybe some part of the sun at high resolution, et cetera, et cetera. But full disk at high resolution uh, over a long period of time in multiple filters near simultaneously, that's a combination which has not happened. And it's a spectra, you cannot do that. Spectra, you get one cut across the sun, maybe two cuts across the sun. You want to know where flare happens. We cannot predict, but that needs full disk information. Spectra will not allow that. Yeah, uh, you said something like uh, these flames go up in 10 milli seconds interval, but then uh, what the time resolution you have, that looks like a few minutes, you know? Sorry, what was the question? Uh, you said the flames happen in 10 milli second intervals, flames going up and down. But then the uh, instrument doesn't have that time resolution. Yeah, 10 millisecond we don't have. Yeah. Clearly, we would have liked to go that fast, but that's uh, trying to address some different kind of phenomena. But our, one of the prime drivers here is the flare initiation period, which is getting there in seconds kind of time scale, not milliseconds kind of time scale. So we have designed modes and approaches in a way that you can potentially get to that early period of flare within you know, much less than a minute kind of time scale. But each image of the sun is taken, especially the region of interest part, in four seconds. It's not a minute. So you get an image of the sun every four seconds. OK. With that, let's thank Ram. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, our next speaker, I invite uh, Professor Avinash Deshpande to talk to us about the project which is here at Indian Sky Watch Array Network, one. Can even sit here, right? Okay. As you want to. Oh, thank you so much. Hmm? No, this is it fine? Yeah. Let me first uh, 
thank the organizers of the ASI 2023 for giving the opportunity to share something close to my heart, uh, uh, something that would appear very ambitious, uh, but looks like with the cooperation of uh, all the like-minded people across India, uh, it might actually materialize. So this is uh, SWAN, uh, a short form for Skywatch Array Network. It's an initiative uh, at uh, Raman Research Institute, which has uh, been supported even today, uh, even though I'm not formally part of uh, the institute. And uh, this is the sketch that was made 40 years back as a front page of a, of a seminar report has come in handy. Uh, and so uh, really what, this is what we are trying to achieve. Uh, just to remind ourselves, uh, reorient ourselves to uh, weak photons at a radio, uh, I just uh, uh, would like to underline the challenges at radio frequencies, which include the radio frequency interference, uh, of which you must have heard a lot about. Uh, also, accompanying that, uh, other than the native thermal sensitivity, is a real problem of confusion due to limited resolution. So, uh, which of course is defined, uh, the limit is defined by the diffraction limit, uh, lambda upon the size of the aperture. The other aspect peculiar to radio is uh, there are no detectors available. Uh, and so, but the ease is brought in by various aspects, uh, and they actually is a boon and that there are no detectors, uh, otherwise one would have been using them and losing some potentially valuable information, one can use uh, antennas as sensors of the electromagnetic field itself, and not just the intensity, uh, or just not counting the number of photons. Fortunately, the photon density is uh, very high, uh, the phase space density, and so classical description suffices. Uh, we don't have to worry about which slit the photon went. and. Uh, we can actually measure at both the locations uh, everything uh, and still correlate without losing coherence. <clears throat> and what becomes most important uh, and valuable at uh, radio frequencies is now, since we can measure the fields, the phase becomes measurable. And this is a huge advantage that has been exploited by radio astronomers uh, all along. Of course, the radio frequency interference uh, you know, is almost uh, everything that we use in day-to-day -day life, as well as natural phenomena that we are very familiar with, uh, are uh, the source of this uh, interference. Uh, many people would like to study those things and use them, but they're a nuisance for uh, people who would like to study weak signals from the sky. Uh, and so these are just some examples and how this uh, radio frequency interference would look like in a spectrum. Uh, and all this is familiar stuff. People have been working all along uh, to see ways of mitigating this uh, of nuisance. And uh, they're largely successful, uh, but not always. Uh, there are, of course, uh, you know, interferences produced by uh, other aspects as well, uh, meteor showers uh, uh, will deflect the FM signals, although uh, turning the other way, you can use them to study the meteors and so on and so forth. So I'm not going into great details of it. Uh, I think this particular audience is well familiar with, uh, with these aspects. Naturally, I mentioned the confusion and, the, and that drives the quest for high angular resolution, uh, also independently for studying the fine details uh, in any given uh, source. And so this requires uh, large apertures, which are extremely difficult to make, uh, let alone uh, rotate them. And so uh, this problem was addressed early enough that we have benefited since, uh, where one has uh, appealed to the Fourier domain description of the 
uh, brightness distribution and asked can we measure it in that domain and indeed uh, a, a double slit uh, experiment conducted in a large number of uh, such pairs uh, can actually measure uh, or can be arranged to measure uh, the required information in the Fourier domain and translating that back via an equivalent of inverse Fourier transform, you can gain uh, what uh, direct information you would have liked to have as an image. Uh, so this is well known. Uh, we have many double slits working together when we have n slits made available to us and then earth rotation uh, as well as spectral spread helps you to cover basically the as much of the Fourier plane as you can possibly while the source is above the horizon for typically 12 hours. These are standard examples of it. Uh, uh, this is a picture of VLA and I'm sure uh, JMRD picture uh, uh, is very familiar to you uh, where uh, this both of them seem to have um, same basic structure of Y shaped arrangement of these slits and you can get n into n square order of n square uh, pairs so you can measure these components uh, simultaneously. And so the idea is that in principle people have used this uh, by using separations uh, which have of course on the earth limited to the size of the earth. Uh, but one has gone further ahead uh, and uh, equivalently synthesize uh, earth size aperture. Uh, this is just uh, a kind of sampling that you achieve uh, at a per given declination from let's say GMRT like site. Uh, and uh, if you wait long enough, uh, you can actually cover uh, what is equivalent of a big dish of that size. Uh, Beautiful images are made at radio where fine details are observed uh, at various frequencies by using uh, measurements at various frequencies, even with the same baseline length, you can gain, uh, fi uh, you know, ability to gain, look at finer details. And this is a classic example of uh, Cygnus A, uh, the central portion zoomed here uh, and successively uh, successively fine details are, uh, can be studied by going to appropriate frequencies. So this is just basically to underline our quest for bigger and better and more sensitive instruments to probe uh, uh, deeper uh, and that has continued. Uh, and uh, now people have uh, generally gone and appreciated uh, multi-wavelength nature of the probe which is now more implicit and routine. Uh, in olden days, people used to identify themselves as millimeter wave astronomers and decameter wave astronomers and so on. And, uh, you will see uh, that continuing into the square kilometer array, which is the next thing people look for. While all this is good and uh, the techniques works of aperture synthesis, the key assumption there is that the sky brightness uh, is constant as a function of time. And that's what gives you the room or uh, space in time to measure each one of these Fourier components at your leisure and put them together corresponding to the same brightness distribution. And that uh, is something that has changed uh, in recent time. There's a growing realization that the emission seen from the sky is not steady at all. Uh, although one knew the intrinsic fluctuations, uh, the so-called wave noise, uh, but there are more explicit variations uh, that are uh, always been there and people have been uh, increasing attention to that. So there is, there are searches now for variability and transience in addition to what explicit searches uh, uh, or st studies of variabilities that were taken up earlier. And uh, so much so that uh, people are uh, beginning to have commensal modes eating from the same plate uh, while somebody is observing uh, uh, it for some other purpose. Uh, the same data is being tapped and being looked at for, uh, for variations in, uh, on the shorter time scales. 
so much so that archival data are being reprocessed uh, differently now. Uh, and uh, many times what may have been removed as RFI uh, in earlier processings is now being reviewed. So this sort of sets the stage for a transient story uh, that uh, I'm going to first briefly mention uh, and then uh, mention also along with that uh, what the present status appears like. It may not be the most up-to-date one. Uh, I'm sure uh, you people have heard in the other sessions uh, what is going on and with this uh, uh, radio transients uh, that have uh, taken the world by surprise called fast radio burst. Uh, and then I will come to the Swan context, uh, uh, what is the motivation uh, and what it's trying to achieve and how. Okay. The transient story began, uh, the one that associated with FRB is uh, began in 2007 when some archival data was being looked at uh, and Duncan found, uh, Duncan Lorimer found a burst which was uh, an isolated burst uh, where uh, from that direction nothing was seen earlier, nothing was seen later uh, and most importantly this uh, amount of dispersion which tells you can be a proxy for distance if you know the electron density on the way uh, is uh, turned out to be much, much higher than what can be accounted for by the number of electrons uh, within our galaxy. And so the distance associated with that had to be increased appropriately to uh, place it at much farther distance. And then as soon as you do that, the associated luminosity uh, becomes extremely high um, because you, you know what you have observed and if you assume that it has come from very far off distance, uh, naturally. Uh, in this particular case, it then implied a very energetic phenomena, and people are still trying to understand that. So the signature one, is look, one looked for there is a highly dispersed pulse, a single pulse. Of course, these, uh, this is not an unknown uh, signature. Uh, that we you know, routinely use this in the pulsar uh, game, as well as uh, know how to correct for it. We uh, correct for the refractive index variation as a function of frequency which causes this pulse to arrive at uh, higher frequency earlier and lower frequency later. And one can precisely work out this uh, law once one knows the proportionality constant and correct for it. Uh, after this thing game began, there were, uh, there were reports that this might have even terrestrial origin, what appears to be. Uh, extragalactic spectral characteristics. And this, uh, as you know, uh, was famously led to uh, a microwave oven in the respective guest houses of the, of the telescope uh, uh, where they were seen to produce these kind of signals uh, at the L-band. So it became a a joke at some stage when you said, uh, you know, I've detected something, people started asking, is it your microwave? Uh, but I think the real seriousness uh, came about when in 2013, four such clearly discernible uh, uh, bursts were detected and uh, the trends seen across frequency also were uh, clearly identified and all the cross-checks uh, really confirmed that these are real, real stuff. And uh, of course, we are generally used to this enthusiastic step that uh, when we find something uh, over a certain area of the sky, we scale it to find out how many might exist. And that sort of predicted that if these are real, uh, one would expect several hundreds of these bursts uh, per day. Uh, oof. What did I do? Okay, uh, the important thing to note here, uh, I don't expect you to read the details, uh, is that the predict or the inferred distances for these sources came out to be, uh, co-moving distances came out to be gigaparsecs. And that's what makes it uh, interesting because you can Im imagine um, uh, a few millijansky flux density seen at, uh, at our location translated back to 
uh, these distances uh, would amount to a huge uh, luminosity. So the energy released is in this range, uh, which is orders and orders of magnitude higher than what we are used to, even in the case of strongest of the pulses from pulsars. Uh, I'm not going to go into details. People have been discussing what the possible sources of uh, uh, these uh, fast radio bursts are. Of course, these are potential sources of fast radio transients in any case. Uh, but uh, uh, I will skip over these details. Uh, we can, of course, look at even nearby possibilities and far off and so on, different time scales. So this is just a you know, uh, list of uh, possible things. What was remarkable is uh, if you, so peop, why people think this is extragalactic? Because there is excess number of electrons on the way which cannot be accounted for. And this shows actually that ratio of uh, the observed dispersion measure to the uh, dispersion measure within the expected within the galaxy. And this line, horizontal line sort of demarcates uh, the, the ones that have, uh, are outside our galaxy in principle. And uh, so, uh, Again, I will skip over these details uh, because they are relating to the way uh, things, the story evolved over time uh, and now based on whom you ask, they will have different versions of these stories. Uh, so much so that uh, uh, later I will say the kind of forums that they were using. Uh, so the, the immediate uh, mm, uh, questions were relating to where it's coming from and uh, localization in terms of direction of the source uh, was very important. Uh, and so they were, uh, there were excitements and, uh, you know, frustrations associated with uh, initial thoughts of it, that it might be associated with some particular source and it had its own variability which confused the issue. Uh, but what is what is uh, uh, common and uh, stays uh, uh, regardless of all these other fluctuations is that this has to be coherent radiation. The energies we are looking at are of this order of uh, 10 to the 10 38 to 41 ergs. And for comparison, you can see the, um, the typical radio pulsar uh, energy losses are of this, uh, you know, several orders of magnitude smaller. Uh, there was a stage when there were more models than the number of FRBs. Uh, fortunately, we have now a large number of FRBs. Uh, uh, so this was the, you know, something I, I found very interesting. There were hot debates uh, on Facebook uh, in those days, uh, and lots of things were get, getting thrashed out. Uh, uh, the game has warmed up enough that uh, you know, there are large number of FRBs now known, uh, but the nature of these sources is still unclear. So there are a variety of these things uh, uh, that can be listed and discussed. Uh, each one of them might take its own, uh, you know, uh, level of detail to appreciate the differences from one to the other. But what is common is uh, that they are narrow pulses of few uh, milliseconds and they have excess DM. There are sometimes uh, um, drifts seen uh, where the radiation shifts to lower frequency at later time, uh, and you know it's called sad trombone uh, kind of signature. But most of the stuff looks like pulsar-like. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly run through this. Uh, now there is a FRB catalog that you can look at and follow these things. Uh, uh, so there are, the sky rate is very high. Uh, depends on, of course, what fluence you have uh, limit uh, up to which you can detect. So of course, uh, you require the main challenge uh, for such searches uh, is that you need suitable instruments and strategies. Uh, if you're given n apertures, you should uh, see how to best to use them, whether to look at different parts of the sky versus uh, phasing them together to enhance your sensitivity, it turns out to somebody, some people surprised that actually using an apertures to cover larger part of the sky might uh, become uh, more profitable. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> but in any case, you want to use them together uh, to improve localization. Uh, so, uh, given 
all these issues related to RFI and so on, um, the, uh, people go and hide in a remote place like MWA has done, but there's no escape from satellite signals and even moon reflections of the man-made RFI are, are going to be. So uh, multiple locations is, uh, is crucial. Uh, there are other issues on which one can expand on. And uh, I will uh, not dwell on that. There are techniques that are well mastered at, uh, at all the places who are trying to look for these uh, transients. As far as angular resolution is concerned, uh, Indian capabilities so far uh, are best represented by GMRT, uh, where we get uh, 25 kilo lambda kind of baselines and corresponding resolution. Uh, there is a need to take the next leap to, uh, to go to higher angular resolutions, um, at least on a subcontinental uh, baseline scale. Uh, and so to achieve both these, uh, to facilitate and conduct searches for uh, fast uh, transients, fast and slow transients, as well as to conduct high resolution imaging uh, of discrete galactic and extragalactic sources. Uh, uh, these are two science goals. And, and the other most important goal is to provide and involve uh, and train uh, through hands-on experience, a large number of uh, undergraduate and postgraduate students uh, by uh, giving them opportunity to be involved in all aspects of SWAN, including in from the design stages. Now, uh, I will not elaborate on why it's clear to this audience. Uh, how it will be done is uh, to set up a coordinated uh, network of uh, arrays. Um, a thousand square meter collecting area at each location at 30 to 40 uh, locations uh, across India, working at uh, a decade range of frequencies from 50 to 500. As a phase zero, which is what I'm going to basically describe, is a narrow band setup as a proof of concept at, with eight independent stations uh, and uh, using most of the hardware that. Uh, would I be in line uh, collecting dust has been uh, uh, redeployed uh, to, uh, to make this possible. So the idea is to go from this 25 kilo lambda uh, availability presently to uh, go to three mega lambda uh, uh, baselines. And when we'll have uh, tens of milliarcsecond angular resolution in the process if stations were spread across parts of India, like the way it's shown here. What one is using is uh, uh, eight of the tiles uh, that were bought uh, by RRI at the time of uh, development of the MWA digital receiver to, for our engineers to test it at uh, uh, locally. And uh, a receiver uh, that was built for Yogesh Man's thesis uh, to study, uh, do tomographic study of the pulsar radiation. These two have been put together. Uh, this was, of course, used successfully for making a tomograph of the magnetosphere of pulsars. Uh, and these, this equipment has been reconfigured to create eight station equipment. Uh, before that, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, sessions of uh, or cycles of training of students has happened through a program called CHERA, uh, which hopefully gets revived uh, after this pandemic gap. And uh, this is how the setup looked like uh, at Gauri Binur, uh, where actual observations were conducted. People could log in and take data and uh, analyze it, and so on and so forth. So this is. Uh, you know, set of people who have contributed at various stages. Uh, a large number of students got trained in the process. And uh, we have, uh, these are just the glimpse of the results that, uh, you know, fringe is seen at, on various baselines. Uh, uh, the sensitivity in phase one, of course, is going to be limited uh, uh, because of small buckets that we are using. But there are other buckets that can be used even in, before building new ones. Uh, and uh, so there are lots of 
other developments that took place uh, in the hardware and mechanical design. Uh, these are the people who contributed to it. Uh, there are default uh, and uh, certain modes incorporated by students uh, for watching the sky, where uh, in a transit mode one lets the pi sky pass by and uh, cover the entire declination range at a time. Uh, uh, so uh, there have been other modes to allow uh, low data rate uh, modes uh, in the interferometric uh, to make the interferometry possible. Uh, I think this is the overall setup, the way it looks like. Uh, this is how the tile will look like when it's, uh, uh, these are details of, you can choose any one of these beams, uh, uh, what are called the sweet spots, uh, to point to any one of the directions and, and track the sources by choosing the appropriate combinations. This is how the system looks like, which is developed by uh, these people. This is how the spectrum looks like. Uh, it's pretty clean, uh, you know, except the satellite signals and the FM band. Uh, I will skip through this and uh, just mention that uh, the different heartbeats on, uh, at different stations uh, are going to be a source of loss of coherence when we try to correlate. And it's important that the heartbeats are synchronized and one has done elaborate tests, uh, and uh, the good news is that uh, we can achieve 1,000 seconds of coherence time uh, that allows us to calibrate things and then bootstrap. Uh, this, has, uh, this has been applied to the data, uh, and uh, various students have actually developed bits of software. Uh, this is how the typical scan of about eight hours uh, look like on the, in some part of our sky and these are the fringes after correction and fringe stopping you can get uh, back the stability in phase uh, all this is done by the students uh, i'm just showing them uh, here for example there was a imaging challenge held uh, people were given data and then they were to produce the best possible image over a hundred square degree and people have done this uh, there was a uh, in looking ahead uh, to look for uh, the viable hour design, uh, which will work between 50 and 500 megahertz, uh, an element design uh, competition was held. Uh, three of the, you know, the teams uh, and their uh, creations are shown here, for example, uh, and which will be pursued further. Uh, uh, so. There are lots of things to do, uh, including some immediate uh, um, investigations. Of course, they will involve very bright sources to begin with, and, uh, but that uh, itself has, so this will be the first target source. Uh, uh, you will get uh, this kind of uh, coverage here. These are the stations uh, shown here, Mohali, Delhi, uh, Pilani, Kanpur, Surat, Pune, Gauravidnur, and Chennai. These are the proposed uh, places where we will have, uh, and uh, so there is, uh, there will be enough sensitivity uh, to study several things. Uh, I will not elaborate on the details, but we will have typical fluence in blind searches for uh, transients of the order of uh, 200 Jansky milliseconds. Uh, so we should be certainly able to see. This kind of an equipment is being sent to uh, each of the eight places. The first such has reached. Uh, IIT Kanpur, the next one is, uh, is with the shipper, uh, the shipping company for Isar Mohali, and the third one most probably will go to IIT Delhi, uh, St. Stephen's Delhi. So I will uh, stop here, uh, and thank you for allowing me those few more minutes. Uh, thank you for listening. Thanks, Desh. Yeah. Uh, time for just a couple of questions. Back there. Hey Desh, exciting stuff. So one thing uh, I'm sort of curious, you said that it's 500, 5,000 Jansky millisecond sensitivity. So that is by combining all the eight stations? Yes, thing? yes, yeah. And the 5,000 is uh, single, uh, I mean incoherent addition. And coherent addition will give you 200. So, to two thousand. Combining the signal from eight stations, not the single. Yeah. 
The combination is as assumed uh, already. Which is amazing, by the way. Five so it's eight. either root of eight or eight. Okay, that's the I factor. See. I see. But my main question is, you know, in 2020, chime and stair two, which is kind of an analog of the signal of of the system that you're preparing, they detected uh, radio FRB-like signals from a galactic magnet arc, and even recently, yes, I think last year, I'm aware of it. Again, detected it. So I'm just thinking that why uh, I think there is a great promise of using already using all these eight dishes to search for galactic FRB. Yes, controls. of course. Are one will be looking. At, one will be looking at magnetars to begin with. In any case, so as the first set of right targets. Now? Yes. Uh, awesome. Any any success? No, no, no. This has not yet happened. Uh, I mean, the because of the pandemic, essentially. But we have data that is open uh, for students to play with, uh, taken in the default uh, Skywatch mode, where the eight tile beams in Gauri Vidnur, uh, when, the, when all the tiles were together, pointed in staggered directions to cover the entire declination range, okay, with 30 degrees width in east-west. Uh, those data are available and uh, anybody is welcome to play with those. Thank you. There was a question here, yeah. Not? If there are no further questions, then let all thank you again. Yeah. Uh, our next speaker, Jayesh Goel, who will be talking to us about exoplanet atmospheres and the dawn of the JWST era. Hello, hello. Are you all able to hear me? Yeah, thank you. Okay, first I would like to thank all the organizers for giving me this opportunity for this talk. Uh, so I'll just introduce uh, myself. So I'm Jayesh Goel. So I am at uh, School of Earth and Planetary Sciences at NISER. We have a small group. Uh, we are uh, growing up slowly and steadily, working in the area of uh, planetary science and uh, exoplanets. Specifically, there are two or three of us working on that. So, my voice is a bit muffled today because I'm a bit sick, so sorry about that. Uh, so, today I'm going to take you through the journey of uh, exoplanet discovery, how it started, where, what we did, and where have we reached, and where we are going in the future. So, let's uh, begin our journey. Uh, so, the first exoplanet that was detected in 1992 was around a pulsar. Okay, so this is one of the classic papers uh, that uh, showed uh, that uh, there, there could be such uh, objects that could exist. So this was around a pulsar. And then in 1995, there was a discovery of exoplanet uh, around a solar type star, so 51 Pegasi b. So this was uh, done by Michel Mayer and Didier Killers. They got the Nobel Prize also uh, for this discovery. And uh, it's still debatable why the 1992 one did not get, I don't know, I'm not on the committee, so sorry about that. And uh, so here, uh, after this, uh, the exoplanet uh, field started, I would say, from 1995. That was the first detection of an exoplanet. Then, uh, once we had our first discovery, we started thinking, what are the different kinds of, different types of exoplanets out there? Let's start the search. So many surveys started being set up. Most of them were ground-based surveys. So then there was like WASP survey, wide angle survey for uh, exoplanets, HAPS, Kepler, all this. So there were radial velocity surveys. And the other, uh, so the first exoplanet was detected using radial velocity. And uh, the second is detected using transit. I'll come to uh, talk about transit in a bit. So, uh, and these ground based uh, searches started looking for exoplanets all, uh, all through our uh, galaxy. I am saying galaxy, uh, the reason is there, I'll come to that in a minute. Okay. And the Kepler is a space base that was launched in 2009, so it was quite uh, later. Okay, so with that, all these surveys, uh, we started getting a good handle over the population of exoplanets. So now this population has almost reached 5,000. 
Okay, so and the variety, the variety that you see here is so astonishing that even uh, we can't imagine. There are like hot Jupiters, there are cold gas giants, ocean worlds. So when I say ocean worlds, we have not detected ocean. I have to be, I'm making clear. This is a theory that they might have ocean. We have not seen. So first of all, we have not been able to resolve an exoplanet. So all of them is we know that it is there. We are not able to resolve them. Then, uh, then they might be rocky, they might be lava. But uh, so the main thing to take away is this, there is a lot of variety in the size, like how massive the planet is uh, in terms of size and uh, in their mass also. So size and radius and mass. That is the main thing that we generally constrain. Using radial velocity, we constrain the mass and using transit technique, we constrain the size of the planet. So uh, using this now, we have reached almost 5,000 exoplanets. Okay, so after we have uh, this number, like we started detecting, so initially we have 500, 1000, it was increased. So then we people started thinking, can we detect, study their atmosphere? So here, so this was the paper that actually in the first time in the Astrophysical Journal in 2002, so it showed for the first time that we can uh, detect an exoplanet atmosphere. So this was a detection of a sodium feature. So what these people use, they use HST STIS, uh, Hubble Space Telescope STIS instrument, and using that they measured the absorption due to sodium in the uh, in the planet uh, in the plant which was due to its atmosphere how that technique works i'll come in a minute and show the details of this uh, transmission spectroscopy so uh, this is what then people started thinking oh atmosphere can be studied yes yeah, so let's uh, so it is a good thing like we are making progress and then people started having these big questions now like what is the diversity in exoplanet atmosphere? So we see, we have detected many exoplanets, but there is uh, so much diversity that could be there. Even in a solar system, we have so much diversity. We have Earth's atmosphere that is completely different from a Venus, or uh, Mars, Titan, there is so much variety. So, so, so for the exoplanets that we have detected, almost 5,000 of them, there will be a variety. So that is one question that we have to answer. Then how do exoplanets and their atmosphere form and evolve? How does uh, uh, the atmosphere come in, for, in the first place they come into picture? So they evolve. Is our solar system and Earth unique? Uh, how did we get here? And then of course, the, uh, are we alone in the universe? All these uh, questions. So, may, uh, so these all questions are like a bit uh, far-fetched. Uh, but uh, the field of exoplanets, we have the capability to answer such questions. And then atmosphere also plays a very important in terms of life. So like uh, in the Earth, uh, Earth radius is 6,400 kilometers. Out of that, only 100 kilometer is uh, uh, the atmosphere. But uh, without the atmosphere, the, equal, the temperature of the Earth would have been like uh, uh, minus 18 degrees Celsius if you compute the equilibrium temperature of the Earth. But if you add the atmosphere, it causes the greenhouse effect and it becomes it, uh, like 15 degrees Celsius where we'll feel warm and life can evolve. So that is one of the, the most important of the atmosphere place. Like it, of course, you need the gas to breathe and all that, so you need the atmosphere. But in terms of regulating the temperature also, uh, the atmosphere plays a very important role and therefore for life. Okay, and then uh, why uh, understanding the atmosphere is important to understand the habitability? So we can have lessons from our own solar system. We have our Earth with equilibrium temperature of 255 Kelvin and actual surface temperature of 288 Kelvin, but Venus, with the equilibrium temperature of 226 Kelvin, the surface temperature is 700. It's so hot. So the, basically, the composition of the atmosphere is playing a role here. For the Earth, it's like oxygen and nitrogen dominated where we can breathe and life can evolve. But here, it's CO2 dominated atmosphere. So there is with sulfuric acid uh, rain and all that. So life cannot evolve. So atmosphere plays a very important role in governing the habitability of the planet. And that is why uh, studying uh, atmosphere is important for habitability. Now, I told you about the big questions. So to answer those big questions, we have to answer some small questions first. And these are those. Which molecular species are present in the uh, exoplanet atmosphere? What are their abundances? What is the temperature distribution on these exoplanets? Uh, what kind of chemistry dominates? What thermochemical processes dominate? Do uh, these planets have uh, thermal inversions? Why, uh, why thermal, uh, thermal inversion is important? Because like we have stratosphere. So that, then if yes, what species is creating them? Like for Earth, ozone creates thermal inversion. So can that exist? Are there any trends? Can we have classification? Like stars, we have HR diagram. Can we have such classification for exoplanets? And then uh, what is their atmospheric metallicity and carbon to oxygen ratio? Are they cloudy and hazy? And then can we decipher the formation of history of exoplanets from their atmosphere? So all these detailed questions co uh, come in our mind when we uh, try to answer the big questions. So how do we answer these questions? Uh, 
so uh, uh, there are many techniques that are used, but in this talk, because uh, the time is less, I'll focus mainly on the transit method, which has been one of the most successful. Most of the exoplanets have been detected using transit method. So in that simply, you have a planet that comes in the front of the star, there is a dip in the brightness of the star, and you have detected a planet. So that's simple. So you f find a planet using this technique. Now, once you find a planet, as I said, I want to study its atmosphere, but there are 5,000 of them. I can't study each and every of them. So I have to identify suitable targets. So what do we do is uh, the targets that, uh, have, uh, that can have atmosphere and sufficient enough to get a good SNR. So that, for that, there is one simple calculation you can do is by computing the scale height. So the H is the scale height, KT by mu G. So it depends on the planetary temperature, uh, the mean molecular weight, and the planet gravity. So higher the temperature and lower the mean molecular weight and lower the gravity, the, they, are, they will have a big atmosphere. So large scale height, you have a good, uh, sufficient uh, big atmosphere. And these targets are very good uh, uh, for doing transmission spectroscopy uh, to understand their atmosphere. So uh, in this, uh, so uh, for this, uh, this is maximized for hot Jupiter and warm Neptune. So hot Jupiter and warm Neptune will have bigger scale heights and that's why they are like the best targets for doing uh, uh, trans, uh, atmospheric studies. So uh, now once you have identified the targets, which telescope to use? So, uh, so in generally when we want to study exoplanet atmosphere, the aim is to achieve the highest uh, high SNR and large wavelength coverage. Why large wavelength coverage? Because there are many molecular species which can span all the way from UV to infrared. So you have to detect like water molecules, CO2, carbon monoxide, all these things. So the bigger the coverage, uh, the better it is for uh, uh, atmospheric characterization. So in, in the initial years, uh, the HST, the Hubble Space Telescope, has been the flagship for studying exoplanets. Now J JWST has come into picture. And VLT, because VLT, massive aperture. And it has this instrument called Force 2, which was very helpful in detecting various species in the optical. So how this transmission spectroscopy works? So in this, uh, when the planet comes in front of the star, there's a dip in the brightness, as I said. Now you measure this dip in the brightness in different wavelengths. Okay, so uh, like you measure it in 1.8 micron, 2.1, 2.3 as, uh, as it is showed here. So depending on which molecular species is present in the planet's atmosphere, the planet will look bigger or smaller. For example, if suppose I have sodium in the planet's atmosphere, the planet will look bigger. So in that case, the dip will be higher. So that means that you have detected sodium in the uh, planet's atmosphere. If suppose a particular species is uh, not uh, there, so this is, that's why there's a wavelength dependence comes into picture. And this is how uh, transmission spectroscopy works. You, from our like, uh, measurements, experimental measurements on Earth, we know like, where different species will absorb. And that is used as a template. So I'll explain to that how that works. Okay. So uh, once you have this, uh, 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 like from the telescope, you have the observations. So the observations basically look like this. So here what I'm plotting is, wavelength on the x-axis and rp, the radius of the planet to the radius of the star on the y-axis. So this transmission spectra that I showed here as a function of wavelength that I'm plotting here. So this now you see, there are some variations that you can see. So these are the observations for a planet called HD 209458b, which is around 105, uh, 159 light years away from Earth uh, with a 3.5 day orbit uh, around a sun-like star. So there are definitely variations. Now, what these variations mean? How do we understand this? So there comes into picture the atmospheric modeling. So what these models are? So models are basically, you have to simulate everything in the planet's atmosphere. We do that for the Earth. Like if you're on your cell phone, you look at the climate or weather prediction. So they are basically simulating the Earth's atmosphere. You have dynamics going on. You have radio transfer, chemistry, uh, clouds. Everything is coupled together, and that is how you uh, be, uh, solve all of these equations together in a supercomputer, and that is how you try to understand, uh, basically model the planet's atmosphere. So similarly, same we have to do for exoplanets. One, you have, once you have the observations, we simulate the planet's atmosphere. That can be done in one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional. And then we apply that to the observation to interpret what is there in the planet's atmosphere. What is its atmospheric composition, temperature, or winds, all those things we can constrain. So this is now what you see here is, basically, uh, now, uh, the model, the best fit model for that per, uh, one uh, spectra for HD 209.45B that I showed her. So there were some colors here which are missing for some reason, but that's all right. So here what you are seeing, so this slope you see here, 
This is basically the same Rayleigh scattering slope that we see that has lambda to the power minus 4 dependence that we see in the Earth's atmosphere, why the sky is blue. The same now we can see for an exoplanet atmosphere. So remember this is the plot like wavelength versus RP barrier. So there's a dr drop in the, uh, the, the radius of the planet decreases. So this is the Rayleigh scattering slope that you're seeing here. Then there's a clearly a sodium absorption. There is a potassium. Of course, now you can come and say, oh, the, the error bars are massive. Can you, can you say that? Yes, I agree that error bars are massive. So we, this is with the HST, but we keep refining of that. We're refining our observations and reducing the error bars. Then, but the clearest feature is that of the water. So this is the water feature at 1.4 microns. So water is one of the strongest uh, species that has been, I mean, uh, I should not say strongest. So it has a very good, uh, many absorption bands in the near infrared and infrared. So it's uh, quite well, uh, means well suited for detection. And we have detected that in many hot Jupiter and warm Neptune planets. And this is what you see here in, uh, is uh, uh, the water detection. And this is from uh, one of my papers where we applied our uh, model to understand the observation. Now, what I was talking about was basically exoplanet transmission spectroscopy. Now, in that, uh, like in the transmission spectroscopy, the geometry is that you come in front, uh, the planet comes in the front of the star, and you are looking at the uh, uh, change in the radius of the planet as it is coming. But there is something called emission spectroscopy also. So, uh, in transmission spectroscopy, uh, you generally, uh, it is a favor to uh, detect what uh, molecules are present in the planet's atmosphere. But one of the important things that is uh, important for a planet's atmosphere is pressure temperature structure. And why that is important is, so this picture I'm showing here is, is a pressure temperature structure that we get for Earth. On Earth, we just launch a balloon with an instrument. Uh, this, this balloon was launched by myself, so in the uh, Bay of Bengal. And you measure the pressure temperature structure. Now, this uh, governs uh, basically the weather and the dynamics on the Earth. So every day, these are launched at airports and everything. So all, all over, uh, like airplanes depend on these measurements. But we can't do that for exoplanets. So how do we constrain the pressure temperature structure? Because if you want to understand the climate of other planets, we need to understand its pressure temperature structure. And there is where emission spectroscopy comes into picture. So in the transit technique, what you're doing is when the planet goes in front of the star, you look at basically this limb region. That is the main region you're probing. But in emission spectroscopy, you can get the entire day side. And how is that? So what we do is just before the planet is about to go behind the star, we take a measurement. And once the planet goes behind the star, we take another measurement. So you have star plus planet minus star. So you get basically the planetary signal. Of course, the, it is, the, this uh, measurement is very challenging because the SNR that you, uh, you, because you are trying to get the planets, uh, the photons directly from the planet, in a sense. So this is what emission, spectro in, uh, emission spectroscopy for exoplanets mean. And in this, you're looking at the basically, in, for a tidally log case, the day side of a planet's atmosphere. So you get the whole uh, day side disk. In this case, you're just getting the limb. So th uh, therefore, these two uh, methods are complementary. And in this, we can, uh, the emission spectroscopy or, uh, uh, can also help you constrain uh, the temperature of the planet very accurately along with its pr uh, pressure temperature structure. So uh, in this, uh, what uh, basically uh, the pressure, okay, so the, the words are missing here uh, because of the color. So this is basically uh, uh, using transmission spectroscopy, you can only see a small part of the atmosphere, only this much, okay? But using emission spectroscopy, you can see much deeper in the atmosphere. So you can probe much larger part of the atmosphere using emission spectroscopy, which is not possible uh, using transmission. And then uh, these pressure temperature profiles have multiple regimes. Like you have convection, radio diffusion, uh, then radio active part and optically thin region. So all of this can be constrained using emission. Of course, we can't go uh, much uh, below that. After a certain uh, level, the optical depth will be so high that it, it, it won't probe. But the main thing to take away is using transmission spectroscopy, you, can't, you probe a very small part of the atmosphere. While using emission, you can probe much deeper. Okay, so using this technique, actually we detected thermal inversion in atmosphere of an exoplanet. So this was for the first time, uh, this was for a very hot, ultra hot Jupiter exoplanet, was 121b. We managed to detect a uh, thermal inversion. And how this was detected is, uh, the, because if you have a thermal inversion, it will emit instead of absorbing. 
and that is what you can see here. The water is emitting instead of absorbing and this we observe in the Earth's atmosphere as well. If uh, because of the thermal inversion, the CO2 emits from the stratosphere and that you can clearly see in the Earth's spectrum. And that is the same we are seeing here is H2 is emitting instead of absorbing and that is how we detected a presence of an inversion layer in an exoplanet. So this was the first big step. Of course you can say that this is a hot Jupiter, but this is the first step in like we can detect inversions and slowly we will get to planets where if they might have thermal inversion due to ozone or some other species which is important for life, we might be able to detect. Okay, and uh, the, now there are actually two basic methods to infer any properties of exoplanet. So in this, there are two approaches. One you like, uh, you have forward models. So in the forward models, you develop your model using physics, chemistry, everything you add. And then when your observations are coming, you try to fit it without any uh, influence of observations on your model. So that is from the forward modeling approach. But there is another approach which is atmospheric retrieval or inverse modeling. In this case, you have your models, but you relax many of the physical conditions. And, that, and using that also, you can interpret the observation. Now, both of these methods have their own pros and cons. Like in the forward modeling, you are, it is physically very accurate, all of physics, uh, our understanding of physics and chemistry is inbuilt. In, in inverse modeling, you are trying to fit in each and every wiggles. So uh, both have their own advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so uh, now uh, the question, I was talking mainly about hot Jupiter and warm Neptune earlier because they, were, they are like the best targets currently because of the high SNR we can get. But then the question comes, can we constrain atmospheric properties of Earth-sized exo, uh, Earth planets? So, uh, so they hear one interesting system that came into uh, between like 2015 and 2020 is this Trappist-1 system. There we have seven planets and out of them, uh, like most of uh, them are like near uh, Earth size in terms of radius. So four of them are like in the habitable zone of the star. So everyone was very curious, oh, these are Earth size planets. Can we do their transmission spectrum and let's see what we, uh, what we can understand. And this is what the transmission spectra of this, uh, the, one of the Earth, uh, this D, F, E, G. So these are the four exoplanets of around Trappist-1, uh, which are in the habitable zone. And what you see here is basically a flat line. So you don't get anything. So, we, uh, so here, what, uh, what uh, should uh, we take away from this? One is the planet's atmosphere, it is a high mean molecular weight atmosphere. So it's uh, very small, the scale height is very small. So we are not able to detect anything. Second, it's very cloudy. It could be possible that it's cloudy, so it's a flat line. And uh, uh, these are the two main uh, 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 things that could basically cause the spectra to become uh, flat. Or the third is it does not have an atmosphere. Basically, if it does not have an atmosphere, we won't be able to uh, detect it. Uh, so th these are the three possibilities for this uh, plant. We have, uh, so now which of this is there, we don't know. And the further observations are going to happen. Okay, so now, uh, Earlier what I talked about was everything using HST and VLT. Now we have JWST that is operating from uh, basically la uh, last year. Uh, so HST and J uh, JWST, what is the main difference? Main is the mirror size and the biggest is the wavelength coverage. Now up to, uh, for in HST we were only able to go up to 1.7 micron, but JWST we are almost able to go up to 30 micron. That's a massive wavelength coverage that we can have to detect molecular species. So for exoplanets that has been a boon. So one thing we have to realize is that when JWST was conceived in 1990s, the first exoplanet was not even detected. So none of the instruments on JWST have been catered uh, to detect or study exoplanets. But the people in the exoplanets have started to uh, like uh, uh, utilize the instruments on JWST as much as possible. So there are main four instruments uh, that are there, uh, NERIS, spectro, uh, NIRSPEC, uh, NIRCAM, uh, NIRCAM, NERIS and MIRI. Now, each of these instruments have different wavelength coverage, different resolution. Each of them, they have their own advantages. And uh, so they, they were initially developed for like cosmology, galaxy studies. And, but uh, the, in the people in the exoplanets, we have started adopting these uh, different instruments to, uh, to study exoplanet uh, atmospheres. So, and this was started uh, basically uh, in, the, in the ERS program, which is the early release science program. So we as a team of uh, working in the area of exoplanets got together and uh, like wrote a proposal and a paper also, like uh, we, uh, we proposed some targets that we like to observe. So how those targets were chosen? So uh, the one of the targets was WAS39. So this, uh, so earlier actually the target was different. Because the JWC launch schedule changed, the target also changed because uh, the launch schedule changed, which part of the sky you will look in the, look in the first year will change. So this planet, we have detected three water features already, uh, H2O between 
like 0.9 to 1.7 micron. So this was published in 2018. So we have already detected a plant's atmosphere. It has water features. So this would be a good target to further look into. So that is how this was one of the primary targets, uh, was 13 and became the primary target for early release size program. So it's a hot Jupiter around 700 light years away. And the other main reason is a stable host star. Now actually, if the stellar activity is very high, it can prove a big problem for uh, our observation. And then uh, three distinct uh, H2O features, as I said. So this was our target, and then uh, this is what the results that we got. So I'm showing you only the results from NearSpec Prism. So in this planet, what we have detected is, we detected uh, H2O. Uh, as it was detected by H uh, HST, the biggest discovery was this di discovery of carbon dioxide. In the, so this was never uh, detected in exoplanet atmosphere, and this was mainly because of the wavelength coverage. Then there was a tentative de uh, detection of SO2. It is not yet certain, it's a tentative detection, then sodium and carbon monoxide. So all this around four to five molecule de detection in this plants and the, using this molecules, we were able to constrain its metallicity, the atmospheric metallicity and C2O ratio. So this was the main thing that, uh, uh, that we learned from the, uh, I'm not showing the entire results. So there is uh, one more uh, result of WASP 96 that uh, one of the students working with me has a poster here. So you can look and uh, understand that, uh, the WASP 96 results from JWST. And then uh, now, uh, since uh, the time is limited, I'm going, uh, I'll mention where we are going in the future, in the field of exoplanet. Now, uh, initially with the Kepler, uh, with the Kepler detected many of the exoplanet, almost 3,000 of them using transit detection. Now that was only in the one part of the Milky Way, only this part. So the entire Milky Way you can see is still remaining. So we have just detected most of the exoplanets in this part. Then the test came along. The test is like all sky survey. It is doing like 26 days all sky it is doing. But because it is an all sky survey, it is not looking very much far. It is only in the nearby regions it is looking into. But we are getting good uh, new detections. Every, like almost every one, one week, there is a new detection of exoplanets using, using test survey. So you had Kepler detected many planets, you have tests. So now we have a good count. We have almost reached more than 5,000. And slowly, slowly, uh, we will start characterizing them. Now initially, we were focusing on hot Jupiters. Now, slowly, slowly, we are getting to smaller and smaller planets. Now, that is very challenging because as you go, as I said earlier, for TRAPPIST-1, as you go to smaller and smaller planets, uh, uh, the, first of all, the atmosphere is small, the scale height decreases. Uh, so it can be, uh, you see, an SNR becomes very, uh, means it becomes very challenging to get a suitable SNR uh, to characterize the atmosphere. So you can see the, and here I am showing the mass, as the mass uh, decreases, it becomes difficult to characterize. And that is why uh, in the future we are going to smaller and smaller planets in terms of size and mass in term, uh, for characterization. Okay, so I'll basically finally end my uh, talk here and uh, uh, giving this general take home messages. So uh, basically there are a lot of diverse uh, planets out there. So each can have different types of atmosphere. Hot Jupiters and warm Neptunes are currently the best targets uh, to refine our atmospheric characterization techniques. Transmission spectroscopy can be used to constrain the atmospheric uh, composition. Emission spectroscopy can be used to constrain PT profile. And then we have done for WASP-121B where we have detected a stratosphere. Then we have uh, forward and inverse modeling. Both are required to get in-depth so that uh, both approaches can be used. And then we have detected uh, many species using HST and VLT. And now with JWST, more doors are being opened. I just talked about the ERS program. The more uh, results are going to come soon as we go ahead. And then we are slowly moving towards colder and smaller planets as uh, for atmospheric characterization. It is quite challenging, but we are slowly moving there. So thank you very much, everyone. We'll come to question. Thanks, Gareesh. Time for some questions. Hi, Jay. So there is this observational bias which keeps on bothering me in the field of exoplanets, which is that you really detect it for transmission spectroscopy. You are really going after hot Jupiters, uh, which are close, you know, close in, right? Yes. This is the unlikeliest of planets to host life, right? That is so true. When do you expect that we might have the observational capability to actually do transmission spectroscopy for, for atmospheres, for Earth-like rocky planets, which are not so close that life is ruled out? So we have actually started doing that in a sense. So uh, for TRAPPIST-1 HST, I said, uh, we, we tried for TRAPPIST-1 using HST. And using VLT also, there is one Earth-like exoplanet LHS something number we observed. But in that case, in most of the times, we are getting flat spectra in that case. So now, one of the reasons is either it does not have an atmosphere, it's cloudy, or it has an I-mean molecular weight. So uh, it is very challenging. 
So uh, when specifically when you say uh, in what timeline we can say so JWST will be at a means uh, trying to uh, will try to use J, uh, JWST as much as possible to constrain this. There are many proposals in the pipeline to do that. But I think the first targets will be like super earths. We will try to characterize super earths like uh, there is K218B, this kind of targets and then we'll slowly move towards earth like planet. So for that the missions are being proposed. Uh, means at NASA, like uh, terrestrial planet finder and all that. So that is but like I can say 10, 15 to 20 years down the line. So uh, to uh, precisely to say that with JWST we might be lucky and we might able to find something. But uh, the other thing is that we might not able to characterize any of the atmosphere. TMT. TMT. <laughs> TMT is there, yes, that is also there. So TMT is coming 10 years down the line. So that is, that is one thing that could be uh, one of the, uh, yes, uh, the things that could be used, of course. Thanks for reminding me on the TMT. <laughs> yes, yeah. So uh, as you have mentioned, to choose a suitable target for the retrieval, scale height is one of the factor. So here, temperature, I understand that can be determined from the distance from the host star. But how do we get an idea of mean molecular weight? As well as, uh, are there other factors that has been considered to, uh, to choose a suitable target? Because I think that is also a challenging task uh, to begin for the retrieval thing, so. Yes, that is correct. So that's a good question. So, uh, so temperature you get from the distance of the host star, the mean molecular weight is generally comes from the assumption for like, if I am taking hot Jupiter and warm Neptune, now it is reasonable to uh, assume that if it has an atmosphere, it will be hydrogen helium dominated. So if you have an hydrogen helium dominated atmosphere, the mean molecular weight will be just mostly like 85% uh, uh, hydrogen, 10% helium. So comes around 2.3 or something like that. So it comes with that assumption. But that being said, uh, when we do our modeling, uh, we have a series of models where we, uh, we tweak the mean molecular weight of the atmosphere by increasing the abundances of different species. We add more water, we add other heavy species, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. So we have a series of models and using that we constrain then uh, what we see in the observations. But initially in our models we start with hydrogen helium dominated. Now this is for hot Jupiter and warm Neptune. But if we go for super Earth planets and uh, Earth-like planets, then it will become challenging. Then you need a generalized model which will take into account all these different species uh, in your chemistry. So, and then you try to fit to the observation and see. You, can, you need to constrain your mean molecular weight as, as well. So, uh, for selecting targets, we start with uh, more or less a good guess. So, for that it is all right for hot Jupiter and warm lecture, I would say. And what is the second part of the question? What are the other things? Uh, yeah. So, other is basically uh, the... Uh, the number of photons that you get. So basically the stellar magnitude. So stellar magnitude will play a very important role in the SNR that you get. So you have bright targets, then you get a good SNR. So that is, plays a very important role in choosing the targets. So scale height uh, determines which planets are good, but is the star uh, bright enough to get a good number of photons uh, to do our measurement, for transmission spectroscopy. So that m matters. Thank you. Question here. You have written the metallicity of the planet is constrained to 10 of solar metallicity, but what is the metallicity of the Earth? Ah, why are you comparing the planet with the sun? Yes, uh, that's a good question. So here, uh, why am I talking about, so, so this is, uh, so when I uh, say solar metallicity, so I mean very specifically, so here in our model, uh, all the elements that are heavier than hydrogen and helium are uh, basically uh, used uh, when I say multiplied by 10 times to change the metallicity. So uh, more than hydrogen and helium, all the elements other than hydrogen and helium, if you multiply by 10 times, that is our um, uh, 10 times solar metallicity that we say. So when you say that for the Earth, for the Earth it will be very difficult because uh, here we are assuming equilibrium chemistry. In this case, for a hot Jupiter, that is more or less all right because uh, in uh, this is the hot Jupiter, it's hydrogen helium dominated. So in that case, the other species won't change that much. Like it's like 99% hydrogen helium, 1% other species. But for Earth, it's very different. Earth is like 70% uh, nitrogen. In that case, uh, will this work? Uh, it will be, it will become challenging to use this metric of 10 times. Then yeah. maybe it is nice to compare it with Jupiter. Yes, yeah, so we compare with Jupiter. Actually, there is a plot which I don't have here. So we compare with Jupiter. That's why, because it's hydrogen helium dominant. Thank you. For that, it's Andesh. Hmm. Thanks especially for making it despite not feeling so well. With that, I also invite okay. our last speaker for this session, Joan Inan, who is going to be talking to us about evaporating exoplanets.
Uh, first of all, uh, I thank the organizers and the SOC for giving this opportunity to present about evaporating at exoplanets and radial velocity, et cetera, in this conference. Um, thanks to the previous uh, speaker, Jayesh, my life is really easy. Now I can like, really dive deep uh, into this uh, exoplanet field. All right, so in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I will try to, uh, first, I'll give a brief overview of the EPRV spectrographs, you know, extreme pressure radial velocity spectrographs. These are spectrographs, high resolution spectrographs, but with some uh, changes to it. Um, then we will dive deep into how stellar radiation, you know, affects the uh, planet and you know how the planets evaporate, and like helium 10 30 as a probe, and it sort of end with a prospect, uh, future prospects. Uh, okay, so this is a slide which I don't have to spend much time on because you all would have seen this at uh, many places. Uh, the mainly, there are many methods by which we detect exoplanets. Uh, two of them, the most popular of them, are this transit methods and the radial velocity method. So the transit method, as uh, Jesh explained, is basically you keep staring at the star, you keep counting the flux coming from the star, and wait for, if you're lucky, wait for the planet to cause of cross across the field of the disk of the star. And as it does, it blocks a small fraction of the light and you get a dip in the total amount of light uh, that is coming from the planet. Uh, the other method, uh, which is the radial velocity method. So here, again, the idea is very simple. When you have two bodies rotating around each other in the space, they go around the common center of mass, which means even though the ma planet is so much more or less massive, the common center of mass is slightly offset from the center of the star. So as the planet goes around the star, the star is also going around the common center of mass. And you can't detect any light from the planet, uh, but you get a lot of light from the star, and you get a spectrum of it. You see all these absorption lines. And if you very precisely measure the shift in those absorption lines, you can do the Doppler shift measurement, which will tell you whether the uh, star is moving back and forth because of the planet. So both of these methods are nice, and it's really exciting when you can actually do both for any given planet. You know, why is that? Because transit method gives you the radius, because it tells you how much it is blocking. The radial velocity method gives you the mass, like you know, what fraction, uh, basically how much the center of mass has been shifted. So once you have the radius, you have the volume, and once you have the mass, you have the mass. Uh, you can now start talking about the density of the planet, right? Uh, which is really exciting because once you have the density, you know, you can put in things like these mass versus the radius plots, and you can say that, oh, whether this planet is like a gas giant like our Jupiter, or it's a water world like our Neptune, or it's like a rocky planet like our Earth, uh, terrestrial planet, etc. So that makes it, you know, like you can start talking about the properties of the planets, etc. So to do this uh, radial velocity measurement, uh, oh, there's also one more very important part of it, like, you know, if you're interested in the nearby planets, which are as close to Earth, because of the geometry, the, you know, the probability of you being able to detect radial velocity has a much higher chance of detecting those nearby ones, uh, just simply from the geometry argument, it's obvious. All right, so if you want to detect something with the radial velocity method, you know, you need to build something called an EPRV spectrograph. Uh, these are just two examples of the two of the EPRV spectrographs that we built uh, at Penn State. Uh, the team, of course, is a large team spread all around the world. Uh, you can see that these are basically high resolution spectrographs, but ultra stable. Like, you don't want anything in the spectrograph to move. Like, you know, the spectrum should not move to sub nanometer level. So, nothing in the instrument should move, which means the temperature should not change, pressure should not change, nothing should change. So, these are like ultra stabilized spectrographs. Basically, a standard high resolution spectrograph, but super, super stable. Uh, so one of this is the HPF, which we'll be talking about more. Uh, the other, which is on a 10-meter Hobie Eberle telescope. The other one is a NOID, which is uh, on the 3.5-meter uh, telescope. Uh, this is not an instrumentation talk, so I will not really talk more into like, you know, how you build such a spectrograph. But I just want to show this image just so that you all get an idea of how these uh, spectrographs looks like. So this is the inside of our NOID spectrograph, uh, where you see this huge grating. It's like almost this big. Uh, and then there's a huge prism is one of the largest prism used in astronomy, uh, at least publicly known uh, in the literature. So this is like a huge piece of glass. Uh, and then this is the basically, and you can see the entire thing is sitting inside a bench which will close. So this will become a cryostat and it will be like temperature controlled by heating pads and all those things uh, surrounding all right. Uh, all right. So 
these two instruments, uh, and so these are not the, you know, there are many EPRV spectrographs out there, like uh, HAPS is the most famous one, you know, it sort of revolutionized this field of uh, stabilized spectrographs. Uh, there's a new one by Europeans, uh, Espresso, uh, Espresso on the VLT. Uh, so HPF and NOID are like, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, like this decade sort of instrument. And you can see that, you know, uh, HPF is a near infrared spectrograph. So people have been like doing this mostly in the optical because, you know, we understand the systematics in the optics better. Uh, but if you want to study like, you know, late type m 2 f stars, uh, which are much more cooler, they mostly emit in the J band, one micron range. So you need a near infrared spectrograph. So we had, that's why we built the HPF first. And uh, this is just a demonstration of how stable the HPF is. Uh, we could show that, you know, we could achieve up to something like 1.5 meter per second on a Bernard star. So this, even now, is still the most precise radial velocity measurement uh, in, in uh, near infrared. Uh, optical, uh, the second instrument is NOID, uh, there, you know, we could demonstrate stability of like up to 50 centimeter per second on multiple stars. So in both these cases, we are actually limited by the stellar activity, you know, the, the surface flows on the star, which prevents you from making even more uh, precise measurement, because the instrument itself intrinsically is much more stable than uh, these values which is shown over here. So we are basically at this, the field has basically gone from an instrument limited scenario which was preventing us from discovering planets to stellar activity limited scenario. The, the instruments are much better, but the stellar activity has to be constrained much more. All right, so thanks to all the different instruments out there, we have you know, thousands of more than this is just a screenshot I took two days ago from the NASA Exoplanet Archive. You can see all this latest update if you just go to NASA Exoplanet Archive. Uh, we can see that now there's like more than 5,000 exoplanets discovered. And this plot over here shows how this field has been sort of going up exponentially. Like, you know, we have been uh, increasing in the number of detections over time. So this is great. Now that we have like thousands of exoplanets, you know, people can start asking questions about, you know, about the demographics of this planet, like, you know, what it is, like, you can do some statistical analysis and things like that. So one of the first thing, like, you know, uh, that people noticed is that, you know, not all planets are created equal. Or maybe they are created equal, they don't survive in the same way. Uh, which is what is shown by the plot over here. So on the x-axis, you have the planet size, uh, and then y-axis is the number of planets per period. This is the occurrence rate. So different methods of exoplanet detection have different observational biases. You know, you detect a certain kind of a planet with a certain method versus the other. But you can model all of this, and you know, you can correct for it. Like, you know, if you're doing a statistical study, like, you know, what should, what might be the occurrence rate of a certain mass planet, certain radius around a certain kind of star. So this is after doing that. This is from a uh, Fulton paper. So this gap is called radius valley or also called Fulton gap. Uh, you see this, there's a dearth of planets around the size of about 1.8 Earth radius, right? Uh, so these are like the Neptune-sized planets which are sort of missing uh, around that point. So and this is question like why? Like, I mean, what happened to those planets? Why are they not there? So there are uh, many hypotheses, actually primarily two hypotheses, a few more other things. Uh, one is that, you know, maybe when these planets formed, the, the protoplanetary disk had already started evaporating away and they didn't have enough gas to sort of, you know, create an atmosphere and become big. Or it could be that, you know, they were formed, but then the photo evaporation, like the, from the radiation from the star making these uh, planets evaporate, uh, sort of resulted in this. Uh, so this is a plot which is basically the same as what I showed earlier, but in x-axis there is now y-axis here, the planet size. And on the x-axis is the stellar intensity radiation. And the, the contour plots basically show the, uh, recurren the occurrence rates. And you have this valley uh, in the middle over here. Uh, all right, so how do these planets evaporate? You know, like if you think in terms of optical light that we see, most of the optical light which you know, hits the star basically gets scattered away or something like that, right? Like, so you, nothing really much happens. It's for most of the optical photons, right? it either gets scattered out. But that is not true if you are looking at the XUV or the extreme UV uh, or X-ray kind of wavelengths, because they can immediately ionize uh, hydrogen or helium, which is in there in the most of these uh, planets. And once you ionize these, these free electrons, they are free, they go around randomly hitting random stuffs and basically converting all of that energy into temperature in that atmosphere. So these wavelengths are extremely 
uh, important because that sort of heats up uh, your at entire atmosphere. Uh, and the if we sh uh, this just uh, shows that over here. OK, so you know, what happens if you heat up the atmosphere? You know, like uh, this plot over here is this uh, classic Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution versus the speed on x-axis. So if you heat up, you basically start boiling off things, right? So if the one easy number to keep in mind when you want to study like what fraction of molecules will escape is just simply the ratio of the gravitational potential these molecules has to escape to the thermal energy that this gas has. So let's call that lambda. So if this ratio is like you know really large, you know, like some gravitational potential energy is like 30 times higher than the typical thermal energy, then you have only very few molecules escaping. So you know you would call it a bound state system of the planet. Uh, but if that ratio becomes less, you know, something like 50, 10 days slowly, you start having few molecules escaping. So initially it's all those, you know, easy to boil off like hydrogen, helium kind of things. But once you have a significant fraction of them going because of the collisions between them, it takes all the other molecules with it. You know, so you enter a regime of hydrodynamic flow, right? So the entire gas just flows like a fluid uh, out of it. And you will end up in a scenario like a park of wind, uh, like in, uh, in planets. And the Parker winds are nice. Uh, they're nice because they're very easy to model. Uh, this, the isothermal uh, Parker wind, for example, has only two parameters where the temperature of the gas basically determines the velocity field at which this wind is going up, uh, which is this plot here shows the velocity solution. Uh, the other thing is the mass loss rate, which determines the density field. So, you know, you get a full model of the wind, the velocity field as well as the density field by two parameters. Uh, and one kind of nice thing to uh, sort of, again, a rule of thumb to keep in mind is that most of these scenarios are energy limited, right? So we said our assumption is that this planet is evaporating because of the radiation from the star. So if that is the case, we expect the mass outflow to be basically proportional to the amount of radiation that is falling on the face of the planet, which is this uh, pi r square multiplied by the x uv radiation, uh, divided by the potential it has to escape, dm by r. Uh, so this gives you like the typical uh, number that we are talking about. Uh, one really cool thing that you'll notice that if you take this r square in the numerator and club it with this m by r here, it gives you a very rule of thumb uh, to check. Uh, it is that, first of all, the mass outflow is proportional to the amount of UV radiation, extreme UV radiation that is falling on the, these planets. And then it is inversely proportional to the planet density. So m by r cube, which is like the planet density. So it's so anytime somebody tells you a planet, you can quickly calculate these two numbers and see how likely that they will evaporate uh, because of the radiation. Uh, okay, so this has been uh, shown to be actually sufficient uh, to explain this uh, radius valley gap uh, by various groups. So this is a simulation by Lehmer and Catling, which shows that even if you start with same amount of you know, planets at all these different sizes, you evolve it based on a certain irradiation history of the star. All these Neptunes, uh, which they will not be able to hold on to their atmosphere, so all of those uh, planets which are here will basically lose their atmosphere and get piled up on this side of the curve over here. So they'll become these rocky planets. Uh, the Jupiters, which are like you know mass enough, can still hold on to their atmosphere, so they will survive here. So that will explain this gap here. But I should want that you know a model being sufficient to explain the theory does not mean that is the only mechanism. It is quite likely that there are other mechanisms too. But at least this model, you know, can uh, this thing. So, all right. So if you can do this, uh, the next question is, how do we actually detect this? You know, how do we actually measure these evaporating atmospheres? So this is an artist impression of what happens when a planet which has evaporating goes in front of a star. You expect to see a very thin, like, you know, there's a very low density because it's evaporation. Uh, of gas which is like extended really odd. So you really need a, some sort of like a atomic absorption or molecular absorption something which has really high cross-section area so that you can detect even such a trace amount of gas that is coming out. So the natural choice is lime and alpha because you know hydrogen is the most abundant one and lime and alpha is great because it's a huge uh, cross-section if you have a neutral hydrogen there. And this is, in fact, how the first evaporating planets were discovered uh, by uh, Videl, Bajar, and like, groups of the like. So what they did was they basically used the Hubble Space Telescope, and they uh, observed a couple of targets, and they could detect that oh, when this planet was transiting, there was an excess absorption in the Lyman alpha. 
So this is great. Uh, there are, there's one problem. Actually, there are two problems. The first thing is that you need to go to space to do this measurement. You, know, you have to do Lyman alpha, which means you have to be UV. And currently, Hubble Space Telescope is our only thing uh, which we can use. So this is a quite expensive measurement uh, to do. And the second thing is that our interstellar medium is full of hydrogen, right? So it's not just the planet which has hydrogen. Our interstellar medium is also full of hydrogen, which means unless your star is moving at a very high velocity, you not know, different from the interstellar medium velocities, the Lyman alpha will get absorbed in the interstellar medium itself, right? So if far away stars, you can't see any uh, signal at that core velocity. So you would basically lose out all information of the, that low velocity component. If the wind is very high velocity, then yes, you know, that is far away from the interstellar medium's Lyman alpha absorption, so you can detect. But you basically lose out all the information, which is like the core, the base where these uh, evaporation starts, all these low velocity components. So that is the main problem with this method. So in the last uh, 2000 onwards, you know, people started realizing that, you know, okay, if hydrogen Lyman alpha is not the best thing, what is our next best thing? So helium is the uh, best, the next abundant thing. And as you all know, helium has two electrons. So it has a triplet state and a doublet state. So the triplet state, the transition from triplet to downlet, double, sorry, singlet state is not, uh, is forbidden by dipole radiations. So if you ionize a helium atom, 75% of the time it recombines into some triplet state and then it cascades down the energy levels through the triplet state. 25% of the time it will come to a single state, it will go down all the way to the ground. Now the nice thing about helium atom is that the ground state of the helium atom is a metastable state, right? So it comes very fast all the way to that ground state of the triplet state, but then it is stuck there because there is no dipole radiation which will take it to the actual ground state which is a singlet state. Which means, you know, they usually hang around for like a couple of hours before, you know, some other higher order mechanism takes them out. But while these atoms are hanging around at that metastable state, if a 1030 photon comes by, it's in near infrared, it will get absorbed and then immediately emitted back. But it gets absorbed and it emits back in some random direction. Which would mean that you will get a, something called a resonance scattering absorption line. So the photon, 1030 photon coming from the star, your planet is here, it gets absorbed and immediately emitted back in some random direction. If you're looking on this side, you will see a net absorption in that uh, wavelength. So this was uh, proposed as an uh, alternative mechanism because, you know, if there are planets very close evaporating, there might be some fraction of helium which are ionized, which means there might be some fraction which is uh, metastable helium, etc. Uh, so the pe field really, I mean, people really started taking notice. Uh, but so even this has been earlier uh, proposed by uh, Sarah Seger and group. Uh, it was O'Clock's uh, 2018 paper, which actually caught people's attention because that paper really showed that you know we should look at this because this is such a strong signal we can actually detect it. So what are the main advantages you know, compared to Lyman Alpha? The first advantage is that our interstellar medium does not have much. Uh, ionized helium, so there is really no much metastable helium on the way, which means they will not get absorbed in the interstellar medium. You can look deep further out. And it's not just the interstellar medium, even our Earth's atmosphere does not have much ionized helium, so we can actually observe this from the ground. You know, we don't have to send space. And if we can observe it from the ground, that means you can use our massive telescopes and our massive high resolution spectrographs uh, to do these observations in high resolution, right? So you know, like space-based, we still don't have a high-resolution spectrograph in the space, so all we have to do is these low-resolution observations. But if we can do high-resolution spectroscopic observation, you can actually start disentangling a planet signal from the star, because a planet, if the eccentricity is non-zero, will have a non-zero velocity as it is transiting your star. Right? So if you have a high-resolution spectrograph measurement, if you see an absorption line, you can actually check what wavelength that is, if, whether it is in the stationary frame of the star or from the planet, and you can be dead sure that this is from the planet and not from the star uh, which is behind it. All right, so at this time when the 2018 paper came out, we were actually just commissioning our HPS spectrograph. Uh, this is just a celebration photo of uh, our first light uh, when we got an HPF in 2018. Uh, this is on the 10 meter Hobie Eberle telescope, and this was a near infrared spectrograph from 8 to 1.2 micron. So we decided, oh, this is great. We should be able to do this. So immediately, uh, we started a program. Uh, we just looked up all the nearby uh, non possibly evaporating uh, hot planets. And then we used some uh, certain atmospheric models of like how the wind is, et cetera. Uh, or if, if that is not available, we use a Parker wind model. 
So we restricted ourselves to look at MDOFs because that was our main science interest. Like all of our science team, we were interested in MDOFs. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, and so we decided to basically follow up uh, these MDOFs uh, for our science case. The, I will not go into the details of how you actually model it, but the concept is very simple. Uh, if you have a static box and you want to measure what is the amount of metastable helium or any material in it, all you have to do is, oh, sorry, this equation got completely scrambled. Uh, all you have to do is just uh, add up all the rates at which you're just causing it and uh, all the rates which are forming it minus all the things which is destroying it. Of course, you have an advection term here because the molecule is entering and molecule is leaving, so you have to change the differential equations a bit. Uh, this is how the final differential equation looks like in the interest of time. I will skip that. But basically, this is an integral differential equation, not a standard thing you learn in numerical methods analysis. Uh, though you need to do some games here to actually solve this, uh, but it's not that hard. Uh, you, you set up some boundary conditions and you can solve for it. And this is basically a one-dimensional model of the evaporating atmosphere. So we did that. Uh, we did all the different calculations based on a certain assumptions of the radiation, et cetera, and we started observing. So meanwhile, we are, of course, not the only people doing this. Uh, Spake had the same year itself reported because they already had the data from Hubble that you know was 107B. This was the first target. They could actually see that there's an excess absorption at the 10A30, uh, as was uh, people uh, predicted for these objects. Uh, the another instrument, Kaminas instrument. This is a, a ESO instrument. So they uh, also were already on sky two years before us. Uh, they started do doing these observations and they uh, were able to discover a couple of. Uh, hot Jupiters were around K-type stars, which is what you would, where you would expect to look because K-type stars have a lot of uh, EUV flux radiation and hot Jupiter is of the place. Uh, but our science interest was around MDOFs, so we sticked with our MDOFs and we want to know like Neptune-sized kind of planets. So one of the predictions of the GJ436, which is known to have an evaporating atmosphere, will have a whooping signal. So we spent quite a lot of telescope time on it and nothing, like we did not detect anything uh, in GJ436. But finally, our you know, continued search helped out. Finally, we were able to detect uh, a signal in GJ436. This was the first, uh, you know, exoplanet evaporating atmosphere, warm Neptune, uh, helium 10A30 detection around an MDOF star. Uh, this is just a plot which shows the signal. So this is basically the spectrum of the star when the planet is coming in front of it, divided by the spectrum of the star when it is not in front of it. So you get an excess absorption at this helium 10A30 wavelength. Uh, so since then, we have been continuing the search, and we have discovered uh, many other planets. Uh, this is just uh, one of the uh, exciting things, this cylinder review, that's why I haven't put the name of the star there. We were able to detect one of the strongest signal ever detected uh, in one of the targets, and you can constrain the mass outflow for a given temperatures, et cetera, for these stars. Uh, this is just the modeling results out of that. And in some cases, when we think that we should be seeing a, such a strong signal, we actually do not see it, which is like one example in one of the targets that we are able to follow. All right. So the main take of message is that this is a great tool, but the extreme UV flux, right, which is what is heating up the planet, is the biggest uncertainty in all of these models, right? Because there is no way we can measure this because our interstellar medium completely absorbs it. We can't observe the XUV radiation of any of these stars, UV, extreme UV radiation. So we have to completely rely on various models, and that is turning out to be the biggest uh, bummer. Like, you know, when you, you think that this plant should have such a large UV radiation, but you observe it, no, there is nothing there. Uh, but overall, it seems like, you know, if you have stars with strong UV radiation, you do uh, end up uh, succeed in detecting uh, these planets over there. The other thing is that now that you have high resolution spectrograph, you start seeing various structures in the profile which cannot be explained by the one dimensional model which I just has described. Which means, which is great because you know, now we know that in, in, a sim in a real case scenario, something like this might be happening. So the plants are not evaporating in a 1D symmetric manner, but in a fairly complicated, you know, extended thing. The tidal effects, magnetic effects, stellar wind, all those kind of things. And high resolution spectrum will let you measure all of this and model, constrain all of this at least. Uh, so the future is like, you know, really great because helium 10 a probe is turning out to be such a successful probe. And we can actually have these uh, models. And there are or a couple of groups in the world who have it, and we have a collaboration group uh, where we do this three dimension simulations and actually constrain all of these various effects that happens uh, when a planet evaporates. Uh, with that, uh, I can uh, stop here and take any questions. Thanks, thanks, Joe.
Kyle, it's very nice talk, sir. It's a very good talk. So I just wanted to know this um, 10830, and the many stars have the chromospheric. Uh, yeah. How do you take care of that? Yeah, so th that is actually one of the trickiest parts. So what we do is that as soon as a star planet leaves, we try to observe the star so that, you know, if, if the variability of the chromosphere is, of course, variable, right? So we can't use out-of-transit observation from many days later. It has to be immediately after the planet leaves. So then we have the reference, the actual measurement. And then you divide one from the other. So it is important that we have this immediately back-to-back. -back. Uh, but you have to be careful because sometimes this exo atmosphere can be much more extended and if you immediate, you think that the planet left the disk, you divide it, you will actually be still dividing out a real signal, which is actually what happened in case of one of the stars. Uh, so you, you, it needs basically multiple observations and look for the variability. Broad and then very intense in many of the stars. Right, right. Uh, so yeah, that's again one, uh, one feature that those broad things will not really change in the velocity as the planet goes, but this, if the, I mean, it also depends on the temperature of the planet. Uh, atmosphere, but if the temperature is not very high, these lines are usually narrower, and they move with the velocity of the planet. So inside a transit, as the planet velocity changes, we see that absorption line moving with it. So that is why the high resolution really helps to claim that this is actually from the planet, not from the star. Hi, Joe. So uh, you mostly talked about uh, atmospheric evaporation. In the last slide, you did mention some interesting stuff, which is stellar winds and magnetic fields. Uh -huh. Now, if you have um, a magnetized stellar wind output from a star which is interacting with the planetary atmosphere. And you also have a magnetosphere uh, for the planet. Mm -hmm. Then that's going to completely change how this mass loss is happening. Yes. Now, uh, exoplanetary magnetospheres has, has not been detected. Uh, Are, sorry, could you repeat? Exoplanetary magnetospheres uh -huh. have yeah, not yeah, right. been detected. Yeah. Do you think that you can, you can refine these observations in a way that can tease out signatures of the existence of magnetic fields in other planets indirectly? Uh, yes. So, you know, one of the things which immediately, as soon as people propose this helium 1030, is that, you know, we all know about the Hanley effect in the sun, which we can use the, uh, basically, we look for the helium 1030 absorption signal and you look for the polarization, you can measure the magnetic field uh, in this. But then that is another, you know, factor of 100 fainter than the signal. So, we are now at that percentage, so you need another factor of 100 to do that. However, there's been a very recent paper, like a month ago, which says that, you know, you can actually, there are a couple of other effects which can put constraints on it. But people haven't done it yet. But, and it's also, like the 3D models right now have too many degrees of freedom. You know, you can't really say there's a magnetic field which is causing a certain kind of structure. But the models are every day improving. So, you know, maybe we might be able to rule out many of the other effects and actually constrain the magnetic field effects. But it's not there yet. Thanks. Joe, any other question? Hi, Joe. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, the signal to noise ratio, what we require uh, for helium line. Mm -hmm. So uh, it depends. Uh, for most of the lines, usually, at least, of course, we are, initial detections are always biased towards the easier ones to detect, right? So mm -hmm. the largest signals are around something like 4% level, so you need a signal ratio of so that you can at least get that. But there's not a single spectrum, right? So you need an out of transit, in transit, after dividing, you should be able to see a 4% kind of a level. So this is still like, you know, we're talking about a signal noise of like 500 or something is sufficient uh, for doing this. Uh, but you need at least that. Uh, and we are, of course, pushing for even higher signal noise so we can detect even fainter of these. Thank you. I don't see any other, ah, oh, there's a raised hand. Very interesting talk. So I'm actually interested in metaslabel helium. Mm -hmm. You said that I've, it's it's a well-known fact now that uh, we can use this to understand the evaporation of hot Jupiters. But also for the warm ionized medium, there are uh, I think there are some indication that we can use uh, 10,830 angstrom line to study the ionization fraction. Mm -hmm. So is do are you also planning to use this instrument to do such kind of studies? Specifically, now there are growing evidence from 5,800 FI uh, Armstrong detection, like in optical range, mm -hmm. suggesting that there should be a considerable amount of detection from the interstellar medium itself. 
Uh, yeah, so I think if you have, uh, of course, like, you know, the, the earliest literature, like when the helium-10 A30 became popular in exoplanets, the AGN community had already used this a lot to study about the, you know, hot gas and they were like, you know, relationships, uh, you know, formulas which tells you if this is ionization rate, this is the expected amount of metastables, like, you know, this goes back to, I think, 70s or 80s. Uh, there will be a lot of literature in astronomy and then it sort of died out. But yes, uh, now that we have these high resolution spectrographs, there are other groups who are using the HPF spectrograph uh, for these kind of non-exoplanet signs as well. Okay. So uh, with that, we bring this session to a close. Let's thank, thank Joe you. and all other speakers of the session. Yeah. Okay. So your uh, tea break will be cut short by 10 minutes. And after the tea break, please proceed to your respective parallel session. And after the lunch, we'll all meet here. And before you leave, please listen to the following LOC announcement. Yeah, so we are going, I mean, uh, there is an announcement regarding transport. Uh, so there will be three buses uh, leaving the campus at three different times. Uh, the first bus will leave at uh, 2 o'clock, just after the lunch. Okay, the second bus will leave at 4.30 uh, p.m. after industry academia session and that is before the high tea and the third bus will leave at 6 p.m. after high tea. So all the buses will leave from the, you know, behind the lecture hall complex where we have uh, taken the photo. So kindly, uh, you know, uh, catch your bus as you want to, you know, leave the campus. Thank you.